first of all, I want to echo what uh, Dr. Krishna said about an unmet need. Um, in the late 19th century, about uh, just a little bit over a third of the uh, epileptic patients were manageable uh, pharmacologically. And in 2018, the number hasn't changed significantly. You can go through studies through the last 100 years, and there is a great need to uh, find a way to treat these people. They suffer, and uh, congratulations on getting this off. I want to echo the uh, point that was just made. Uh, where's the clicker? So, one of the things that's very striking about epilepsy surgery is how underutilized it is. It's, uh, I went back and looked at the literature, and as near as I can tell, it's about the most underutilized treatment for a neurological disorder that's really effective in the appropriate cases. Uh, the types of surgeries that are done, I've broken them down into three categories, resection, radiation, and thermal ablation. They all work in some sense. Uh, they all have limitations and potential complications in another. So if you look at resection, obviously it's highly invasive. It's something this crowd's very sensitive to, bleeding, infection, and so on. Radiation, which uh, we worked on some 15, 20 years ago, uh, can work. It may not be as effective as resection. There's uh, edema and delays to effect. And then thermal ablation, as with the other approaches, lacks cellular specificity, and there's potential for off-target uh, <coughs> excuse me, damage. Um, including vasculature, fibers of passage, and so on. So this just is an example, sorry, I don't have a pointer here to, to show you this, of uh, lit uh, uh, trying to ablate three nodules of a paraventricular heterotopia. That's the far left. Um, the optimal surgical planning would be the is that yellow, my eyes aren't that good, uh, the uh, yellow in the second frame. And then the outcome of the lit procedure shows that they actually missed the third nodule, got the first two, and had involvement of the subcortical white matter and the ventricle. So that's a real problem. Uh, and it's something that we would like to uh, solve by developing a way to, <coughs> sorry, my voice is gone, <coughs> develop a way uh, to non-invasively surgically intervene and spare non-target tissue. Um, and our strategy is to open the blood-brain barrier with, with uh, MR-guided, low-intensity focused ultrasound. Thank you, appreciate that. And then administer systemically, IV or IP, a uh, neurotoxin. And the neurotoxin is, uh, doesn't get through the blood-brain barrier normally, uh, but it uh, can if you open it up or if you get an animal at a very early age. And then destroy neurons while sparing non-neuronal targets. When you go back. And we named it uh, Precise Intracerebral Non-Invasive Guided Surgery, which was just a ruse to use the term, the term ping. Um, this is our experimental setup. If you have any uh, questions about specific issues, uh, I'm happy to talk to you later about them. I don't really have time in the five minutes. And uh, the first studies we did, we uh, targeted the CA3 region of uh, the hippocampus in a rat and we're able to essentially destroy our target area. This, in this case, you can see in the middle, saline treated plus MR, uh, the ping procedure, if you will. And then in the lower frames, you can see where the CA3 cells are gone. And uh, this is fluoro jade staining showing the, uh, uh, that they actually are knocking out the neurons. So we had a couple of questions and I'll try to go through these quickly. First, can ping be effective in other brain regions? And the answer is yes, we've done this in maybe 10 different areas. And can ping produce axon sparing lesions? Uh, we went back to a, a, an old animal that we discovered some 20 years ago that has subcortical band heterotopia. And we chose those because there's fibers of passage going through the subcortical band heterotopia into the overlying neocortex. And this is just a, another ping on one on each side. And uh, looking at the right side, this is again fluoro jade showing degenerating neurons in the area that we targeted. The con sort of to contrast thermal ablation, uh, which would cause damage to the cortical pedal, cortical fugal, vasculature that's shared with the overlying neocortex and the ventricular wall, uh, ping does not do that. This is the uh, last example I'll show you. This is another example using the uh, Tisch rat, and it just shows a sequence from anterior to posterior of MRIs 
uh, going sort of top and middle then uh, lower frames. And I hope you can appreciate that. Uh, I'll just highlight one here. Uh, there's a little uh, light area there that uh, we were targeting. And uh, here we're showing, uh, instead of fluorogate, we're looking at healthy neurons, with new N in the upper right frame. And you can see, hopefully you can see the correspondence between the area that we pinged and there's a dark area that uh, has lost all the neurons. In distinction to that is the uh, myelin basic protein staining in the lower right. And I'm gonna enlarge the left side of both of those sections to give you a better feel for it. So again, new N in the upper frames and uh, myelin basic protein, which is staining uh, uh, fibers, uh, myelin aided axons. You can see where the neurons have been destroyed in our target area, but there's very clear uh, myelinated fibers passing through. So to summarize, uh, we've used a focused ultrasound opening of the blood-brain barrier combined with the systemic administration of a neurotoxin, call it PING, to produce focal neuronal loss. Uh, the neuronal loss can be produced in various brain regions, all the ones we've tested so far, including cortical dysplasias. Axons are spared in the targeted, er targeted area. I didn't have time to show you our ventricular shots, but that's spared as well. And we think that ping could be a value not only for the treatment of epilepsy, which I've framed this talk in, but uh, for uh, uh, any other uh, disorder that involves a, a, a con connectivity disorder. Almost done here. And I want to uh, acknowledge our uh, investigators. Wilson Wang did the vast majority of this work. Matt Anzavino has done a lot of work with it as well, and we thank Sasha Klebinoff for providing the bubbles and our earlier collaborators, uh, Yan Rong Zhang and, and, and Max Wintermark. So thank you very much, and our support, of course. <laughs> thank you. Very, um, very nice work. Uh, my question to you is, uh, what's the time course of neuronal loss um, and whether you see any inflammation or edema associated with neural loss. Oh yeah, there's, uh, there's an inflammatory response and you can see also in the first shot I did of the CA3 hits, there's um, a lot of IBA1 positive monocyte origin, you know, not only microglia, but also probably uh, invading cells coming in. Cells die over uh, a couple of days, kind of typical the time course for when you inject quinolinic acid directly into the brain. It's pretty similar to what was shown in 1980s, 1990s, when people are using that quite a bit. A very nice piece of work, but uh, there are central neurons uh, in the area of prostrema, the, the hypothalamic area, that don't have a blood-brain barrier. So did you look specifically to see if that those, in, those neurons were spared sure. with these injections? Yeah, it's a very important point and was the next slide, but I don't think it's going to show up there. Um, the question is, is it safe? And we've looked there. and, and uh, you can, you could predict actually on the basis of what we're putting in that were the area prostrema, prostrema not to exclude glutamatergic agonists, that most people consuming high levels of monosodium glutamate would have holes in their brains. And so we don't see anything. This is the, that was glib, but I mean the real answer is we don't see anything there. And there are exclusionary barriers in all parts of the brain. That's a wonderful study. I uh, just have a question. Is neurotoxin, whatever used in this study, is safe for human use? And if it's so, is any human experience so far? Can you repeat that? So the question is, uh, is this safe for human use, quinolonic acid, or has there been a human experience with this? Content? There is none. So what's a, a future implication and steps forward well, like, going beyond this? This is wonderful, the foundation. Sure. Like any uh, experimental drug, you would have to go through testing. It's uh, safe at very high uh, dosages, 100 times what we use in, in rats. Um, we've, been at, we've used it in mice and rats, but obviously it would need to be tested to uh, uh, be cleared. It's an excellent point. Oh, thank you. All right, great question. Right, thank you. Thank you.